Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the studies for this week, um, the morning studies. Uh, we're going to continue drawing out the lines um, in the story of Gideon. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for the things that you have been teaching us, for the instruction we receive from your word, for the conviction and power it brings to our lives. And um, we pray, Lord, that you can help us to continue to learn and to grow. We ask, Lord, that your spirit can work upon the hearts of those who are searching for truth. And we pray, Lord, for those that are grieving and suffering in various ways. Um, we pray for those who are uh, studying these things online, uh, the, the people that you have led uh, to these videos and to, to my papers and, and to other things connected with this truth. And um, we just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can continue to work upon the hearts of each person and upon our own hearts as well. Now, be with us now as we open your word together. May your Holy Spirit instruct us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning again. So um, in this study of the judges right now, we're, on, we're addressing the line of Gideon. And we have Judges 6, 7, and 8 that address Gideon. And what we had done, um, I guess I can put this screen up here, change, change the screen. Um, in the line of Gideon, we had this, this line that... Um, has these way marks that we marked out on Thursday. So we had uh, November 9th, so that's the time of the end, and we end up with uh, this period of darkness and that precedes uh, September 11th, 2001, but September 11th is November 9th in this line. That is, uh, these symbols come together here. Now, why particularly do we do that? Why are we taking 611 and making that September 11, 2001? So just to kind of go back, because we need to understand this reasoning. So Judges 611, we had what happened in Judges 611. Anyone remember? So it's going to be an angel of the Lord coming down, right? There came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Oprah, that pertaineth unto Josh the Ebba, Ebba Ezrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So we have this September 11th way mark because this mighty angel coming down. Now, why do we make it 9-11 in this line? Why not just leave it as September 11th? What line are you talking about? The line of Gideon that you see on at the top of your screen there. So we got November 9th, two, 1989, and then it says the prophet and Judges 6, verse 8. So it's talking about this prophet. This is the work of Jeff. And then it, it brings us, Judges 6, 11 brings us to the September 11th way mark. So the 9-11 way mark with the mighty angel coming down. We're going to mark that as November 9th, 2019. So why do we do that? Why do we put two different dates there? Anyone know? Uh, wasn't it the the mirror? Okay. Um, well, a little bit. So, but what do you what do you mean the mirror? How how are you? Um, 
you need to understand what you're thinking. Well, my thought was it was uh, we were reflecting 9/11 onto that onto that particular waymark, um, but it was. Uh, I think it was wasn't it Parmender um, that was doing that stuff on eleven nine. Um, well, Parmender brought November 9th. Uh, it wouldn't have nothing to do with Donald Trump, would it? No. Nothing to do with Donald Trump. So, so first is we have Judges 611. And now you said a mirror, and I was wondering if you were thinking what I was thinking or not. But if you took a, near, a mirror and you put it at above Judges 611, you would get what? 9-11. 9-11. And if you put it to the side and and upside down, so you would have to do both. So you'd have 11 9 Yeah. So you can see that, that this 611, which brings us this this angel coming down, right? So that's that's marking September 11th, that way mark. Um also gives us 11.9. Now we saw that we have these other lines where 9.11 and 11.9 are connected together. Now with this line, particularly what we had done, and maybe that's what somebody means by Parminder, um, this has to do with, um, and, and so maybe that's what he meant, uh, what people meant by Parminder. So this had to do with these periods of time uh, in, let's see if I can find it. So, I'm sorry, I was thinking about the siege on Washington. I don't know why I was thinking that. Okay, but yeah, we had done this line quite a bit earlier. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, that was 1 6, though, William. Yeah, it's a different date, but um, so this was. Is way back here in some of my, my apologies, then that's okay. Isn't I'm, that what this is all about? I make mistakes all the time discussing and edifying ourselves. Okay, so exactly. Oh, good morning, Joyce. Yeah. Good morning. Um, well, I'm gonna have to find it this way, I'm gonna have to search. Um, So, sometimes I'm terrible at knowing how to search. Okay, so this had to do, that's not the right one. Ah, here it is. So this is this is the long explanation. But what we have is we have November 9th, 1989. And we have uh, 360 months, obviously, uh, to go to November 9th, uh, 2019. And that's just 30 times 12, right? So it's no big deal there. But we have um, this September 11th date. And we, we go back to September 11th um, with this 200 months. And we also have 20 prophetic years. So we have this 200 lunar month. And, and all of this is going to be addressing from 9-11 to November 9th. But it's in this structure that is addressing... Um, It's addressing the apostasy and what happened with September 7th. So, so this line is connected to these other lines. And um, we had taken this period of time, and this this is um, how do we do this? This because this related also to some of our other lines. But basically, it's this um, 
777 days from September 23rd and the 200 months. And then you can see that we have different ways in which we take 220 months. So 220 months of 30 days brings us to September 7th. Um, but it's these events that happen with Parminder that are going to lead us to November 9th. So September 7th is connected to November 9th with all these other structures. So I don't know if I want to get into this in too much detail again. Um, but this is going to address uh, the period because the previous period, so I guess maybe a better way to explain this um, in answering this question. The question is, how come we're going to have November 9th and September 11th connected? And that would go back to, well, if we just go to the judges line itself, we can see that this line, the judges line, starts with September 11th as this arrival of the first angel, but the empowerment of this first angel is November 9th. And Gideon is just an expansion of that November 9th date. Right? So, so the first angel arrives at, at September 11th, but now we have 11-9, which is Gideon. And so this period of darkness uh, that goes from 1989 to September 11th is now being empowered by a message dealing with 11.9. So I don't know how to explain it here particularly, but if we, if we look at this, we know that these are connected because we've connected them in other ways. Um, but since we're zoomed into November 9th as a way mark, it needs to be represented here. And this line of Gideon is dealing with the end of Parminder's message and the beginning of this other message, which has to do with July 18, 2020. So July 18, 2020, if we think about it, is an empowerment of this first message that arrives on September 11th. But you're going to see that on this judge's line, we're going to have July 18th as the arrival of the second angel. Now, does that make sense that the empowerment of the first angel can also be the arrival of the second angel? We did do that at an, in another spot, if I'm not mistaken. Well, in the main line that Jeff has, he, he has September 11th as two way marks, the empowerment of the first angel and the arrival of the second. Now, we understand. But we actually found out that that was two separate lines. Right. They are two separate lines. So that's 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 the point that I'm trying to make here. But they are two separate lines. But we're going to see that these these lines that the Jeff has as two separate lines, if we go up a step, right? If we go up that line, we can see that that's about the Sunday law. That in our line, it's because he zoomed in that he saw that. And, and that's what we're doing right, right now is we're actually zooming out from these way marks. We're, this whole judges line is a zoom into the arrival of the second angel as 9-11, which is then that line from 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law line. That line is a zoom into September 11th, but September 11th is the arrival of the second angel. not September 11th as the empowerment of the first angel. So when we look at this judge's line and we now then start to, to pull this line out, like we try to, we're parsing it, I guess, if you want to use the grammatical and analytical term, we're sort of separating, separating out the parts and we can see that the story of Gideon 
addresses July 18, right? Because it's the empowerment of the first angel's message. And July 18th is connected to 9-11 or 11-9, I mean, right? Because we saw that it's part of a structure. Right. And, and we saw that in the Deborah and Barack line that we had um, this November 9th date as part of this structure that begins with the understanding of July 18 as a symbol of the prediction before midnight. And then we could see how Samuel Snow's letters fit in with that. But because November 9th, if we take Samuel Snow's letters and we line them up, November 9th lines up with July 18. Right? When we take Samuel Snow's letters, and we use them in these two different ways. So July 18 and November 9th are tied together, but they really are separate lines. But in the judge's line, they're put as separate waymarks. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. Yeah, okay. So then when we... Um, we look then I'm at the, sorry, it, it does to me. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think it should make sense to people. I, you know, if somebody that's having a problem with it, they can always write a question or ask for clarification. But um, so when we look at judges, these three different lines, we have basically it's judges six, judges seven, and judges eight, though they have an overlap, um, just like, we, we do when we look at other way marks and we zoom into them. Now, in so in this case here, we're looking at this line of Gideon as Judges 6. It's going to be focusing upon the three primary dates that we have had um, in our 777 structure, and that's going to be 9-11, July 18, and December 25th, 2021. But remember, the, the, all of these lines of Gideon are a zoom into, in the line above, they're a zoom into November 9th, 2019 on another line, right? So November 9th, 2019 on another line that is in the line of the judges is this in... Empowerment of the first angel's message. So it's not, it's not, it's not the arrival of the second angel. It's the empowerment of the first angel. And, but yet we can, and we've done this with other ones where we have, we can zoom into a way mark, but we can create different lines. And the reasons we can create different, these three different lines here is that November 9th, 2019, is the part of a structure. It's a start of a structure, which when we look at it is uh, the arrival of the first angel's message, right? You're, you're going to, well, you're going to have three different messages. The first angel being November 9th, the second angel being July 18th, and the third angel being December 25th, 2021. If we're just looking at that line of the 777 structure, and we, we still have to figure out how we, how we're going to lay out all of these lines, basically laying out their family tree, right? So as we get through these lines and we, we lay them out, we should have a connection of all these different lines. But just for November 9th, 2019, on the judge's line, um, which is the empowerment of the first angel, we have three different lines because Gideon has three different chapters that are all seen as lines. And I haven't figured out how to get Gideon to just be one line per se, except what we just said. If we're going to take Gideon as chapter six is November 9th, and chapter seven is July 18th, and chapter eight is December 25th, 2021, then this... Uh, what we don't see here, so here we have De Deborah and Barak, and what we need to, is we need to do something similar to this with the 777 structure 
from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. And in a sense, that's what we're doing here with the line of Gideon. So we sort of skipped a step. Do you understand what I'm saying? We, we, we've taken the line of Gideon and we've looked at each of these as a line, but we didn't place the way mark that they're zooming into. So we need to do that. So the simple way for me to do that is I'm just gonna copy this slide. And there it is, all duplicated. And this is going to be Gideon. And then obviously all these dates have to change. So this is going to be probably could have done it a different way here. I just copied so it. you duplicated it, but I didn't see you paste it. That's because I didn't. Okay. <laughs> I changed my mind how I wanted to do that. There we go. So that's going to be November 9th. The arrival of the second angel is going to be this July 18, 2020. Right. And then these other dates, we have to decide what these are. So I'm just going to, here, I'll just, I'll put them as question marks because otherwise I don't have anything to mark them. And so if we take this 777 structure, then we could actually take this whole line of Gideon and set it up here. So when we went to six, seven and eight, we were skipping this step. Does that make sense to people? That we need to do this first. So then we would have to look at the story of Gideon and decide how the, the story of Gideon is going to line up with these waymarks and what these waymarks are. Um, now, there are some specific things that we, we, we would already know. That we, we know that there are some dates that come in here. Uh, and this one I have to also to change to December 25th. Uh, yes, there we go. Let me do it like that. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm inconsistent in how I label dates, but anyway. So you, you can see here that we, we have some events or we have some waymarks that we, we could easily um, fill in here, right? But we also need to, you know, so we could put the dates in there, but we need to know what these events are in the story of Gideon to particularly mark them. So part of it in when we take these lines below here and we have taken the line of Gideon and saying that this is the first angel arriving or, or pardon me. Yeah. So this line here would be the first angel. This is going to be a zoom into November 9th. Um, we could see that there are going to be dates that follow November 9th and that precede July 18th that we could actually place on a line. And, and in a sense, we might even just say that this first part of Judges 6, we could probably just take these dates if we wanted to and put them there, though I don't think those are the best dates. But we, we need to have some way marks that precede July 18th. The ones that are here in this line of Gideon, these have to do with this formalization of this message which is the publication in the Tennessean. And then uh, this June 27th date. And where does the June 27th date come? Why is that connected here as the empowerment? Does anybody remember what we did with this June 27th date? Why was it so important?
it was uh, based upon Samuel Snow's third letter. Right. So it's going to be based on it's 627. So it's it's it relates to and, and it's not just Samuel Snow's um, third letter, the Pentecost letter, which is written on June 22nd and published on June 27th, because it also does connect to 622 and 627 B.C. Yes. And, and that's going to be, of course, uh, dealing with the. Uh, Josiah and the prophecy of Josiah, right? So Josiah's Passover, so it connects us to Ezekiel. So th there's lots of connections there. Um, and 622, just going back to 622, things that we never addressed. Um, 622 uh, from the creation of the world, what's the significance of 622 AM? It's the Islamic calendar. No, I'm talking about AM. Oh, sorry, that's the, uh, yeah, Enoch. Yeah, Enoch is born, right? Yes, Enoch is born. Adam's age uh, is 622. Right. Which, which becomes really important in, in the context of um, uh, the 65 the 187 and the three, the, the 252, right? And the 360. So all those things are connected to Enoch in, in that way, right? Yeah. Yes. Right. So those become really important as far as that period of time between November 9th and July 18th. So, so that's why I'm saying, you know, that, uh, June 27th. So nothing happened on June 27th. Santa. So you asked about what happened on June 27th, 2027. It's, uh, it's a span of time that goes from when Jeff first predicted the pandemic. It's 1260 days. And 273 days later is March 27th, 2021. And 1260 plus 273 is 1533, the number of days from August 11th, 1840 to October 22, 1844. And it's the year BC in which the Exodus occurred. It's a wonderful manifestation of the power of God. So, um, so that date there stands as a symbol. And if you're going to look at June 27th, it's kind of an interesting um in how it shows up in these different lines. For instance, in Samuel Snow's letters, it's simply a witness to June 22nd, right? So he writes a letter on June 22nd, which is Pentecost, the sixth day of the third month. Five days later, it's published. But June 27th, other than being, if you look in 457 BC, is, is Pentecost. Other than that, June 27th uh, doesn't have any significance when that letter is published, like the other dates are, you know, either like Passover or Pentecost or the true Passover or the day that the dedication of the temple occurred or things like that. But June 27th doesn't have any characteristic other than it's witness to June 22nd. So if you take the, the biblical date, the 11th day of the third month in 1844, and you, you re realize that's June 27th, the date that his June 22nd letter is published, and you double 311, you get June 22nd. So um, now we do have 276. So Angela mentions that in regarding to uh, the number that Ellen White rounds up to 300. And that becomes important here in the story in the lines of Gideon. So the 276 does relate to... 627. And um, Ellen White talks about the 300 on the ship, not the 267 on the ship, or 276, right? 276 on the ship. I think I said 267. So 276 on the ship. And, and we know that three are taken, three are, are, are Paul, Luke, and uh, Aristarchus. Get that name right. 
is that the right name? Um, that that represent uh, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and um, uh, they're taken off from that number of the two seventy three, which is Levites. You could also just say that they're re representing the priests as well. Um, the number three representing the thirty for the age that you become a priest, things like that. But um, so we have this 267, so we can connect it to the line of Gideon, because Ellen White says 300, instead of, uh, I say 260, 276 on the ship, right? Which Where we get the 273 in Judges, not Judges, Acts 27. <laughs> okay, so, so we have that, and we have this, but we have this date, June 27th. It becomes a witness of a part of a structure, but it doesn't have an event on it. The only thing that we do say is it's 21 days before July 18th, and it, it symbolizes uh, from the story of Daniel the, the three full weeks, right? So there's this, he's going to fast for three, three whole weeks. And um, there, there is some other connections, which I'm not going to go into, but um, so that 21 days, because it does connect to... Uh, the history of the four seven times. Now, um, but if we're going to look at, so in this line, we, we just basically took these way marks and, and we put July 18 in here. And in some ways, this line of Gideon from Judges 6 isn't that different from this line here of Gideon that we're trying to, to draw out. Because it's, it's, Essentially, we could put the same way marks there. Now, um, so I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put it like this, and we'll decide if this is the best way to do it. So we're going to have June 22 and June 27. But here, of course, we're not using those verses or because we're we're in actually chapter well i guess we could use those verses too can we're I dealing ask a question chapter. yeah okay on the 276 if you minus set with 300 at least 24 right yeah yeah it, what's well, the significance of that yeah well that's what i was one, and you had 24 people left in which you rounded it up to, right? Because um, this has come from Acts, right? Yeah, but Ellen White's just, she's just rounding 276 up to 300. But we know that that 300 and that it, it comes from Numbers chapter 3. So in Numbers chapter 3, we have a 300 there as well. Oh, okay. That's taken, taken out in the calculation they don't they have 22,300 levites but they only use 22 or 22,300 they only use 22,000 when they subtract it from the number of the the firstborn of the children of Israel which is 273 so 22,273 and you know the question is why did they do that nobody really knows um why well, the twenty, the twenty-five, the twenty-four, would, would it have any? It don't have a significance in the. Not that I know of. Okay. I don't know the significance in this connection here. <clears throat> Doesn't mean there isn't, but. Okay, so um, so if we put these dates here, so we're taking basically we're taking Judges six is the first angel. Judges 7 is then going to be the second angel. And Judges 8 is going to be the third angel, which we just have on this line is arriving. But so we can see that Judges 6, we've zoomed into Judges 6 and we've expanded on it um, in the line that we have from Judges 6. Um, but we have Judges. Uh, so let's go back here. So here, here's this line. So this is Judges 6, but Judges 6 
is going to have uh, Judges 7 as the arrival of the third angel in this line. Yeah, so 24 elders of Revelation 4, 4, which I understand, Angela, except the problem is I don't know how that symbolizes anything on this line. That's all I'm trying to say. So 24 is a symbol, but is should should we take the, the 276 and subtract that difference between what Ellen White um, had is saying 300 on the ship? Should we just take that as as significant? I I can't see why we would where we could use that 24 there. I'm not saying we can't, I just don't know where. As well, I sentence. apologize for bringing it up. I was just thinking to myself. Yeah, nothing sorry. wrong with you, you don't need to apologize at all. <laughs> so for you moved by the spirit. Yeah. So sometimes those questions are good to because you, you might be right. There might be something there. I just don't know of any. And someone else might have the same question as you too. Yeah. Um, right. As I always say, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's only such a thing as stupid answers. And uh, so, so I'm the one, if you ask a stupid question, I could come up with a stupid answer. Or if you ask, ask a question that you think is stupid, I could come up with a bad answer, a stupid answer. But your question isn't stupid. So it's important to ask questions. But anyway, so getting back to this line, we're saying that this whole line is a zoom into that first angel's message in the line of the 777 or the line of Gideon. So, so, so we have one line of Gideon, but we have three different lines that we can get from Gideon by zooming into each of the main waymarks, each of the arrivals, right? The first angel arriving, the second angel arriving, and the third angel arriving, we can zoom into. So we had skipped this step, but now we realize we need it. Um, once we, we think about these lines, but we also know that um, this first part of the line, from what I can see, is just the first part of this line, right? Or the first part of this line is just comes from here. But the question is, why do we do that? Why is this line structured this way? And part of that has to do with um, what's presented in these verses, which we, we put the verses there. We didn't really put the, the events. But in, in this line, when we zoomed into Judges 6, a lot of it had to do with the various symbols that were there. So to go back to Judges 6 again, um, you know, we had this 622 and this 627. And we had symbols that were attached to these verses. 622, um, when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I've seen an angel of the Lord face to face. So we know that this had to do at first with this angel coming down. And we can see that when he recognizes this, that this is a formalization of this message. But then we're going to say that Judges 6.27 is the empowerment of this message. And that's when Gideon took 10 men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. And so in this part, in Judges 6, he's going to go into this destruction of this altar and and then the sign of the fleece. And so what we did is we simply took um, these stories and laid them down upon this line as the formalization, or so the arrival first of this message in Judges 6.34. And that arrival was um, uh, with the trumpet, right? So he's going, the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, he blew a trumpet. And Abiezer was gathered after him. So that's going to be that, that symbol of the, from the trumpets, right? So that connects with 9-11, with the woes. And um, 
and then we're going to have the fleece. So these become this formalization and empowerment of this message. So he, he makes this call, but then there is this testing, oops, testing that's being done. And, and then we have, and, and maybe, maybe there's a weakness in this line, but we just put Judges 7 as the arrival of the third angel. Now Judges 7 then is going to be this message of, of Gideon and his 300. So remember, we have that 300 there in the story of Gideon. So that connects us to that 300. Um, so maybe there's something wrong with this line and just saying Judges 7 is the arrival of the third angel. But in Judges 6, it just ends with the story of the fleece. I got a question. Yeah. So um, I noticed the angel that came down um, in the line of Gideon came down in uh, verse 11. Right. Um. Is that significant? Because we've got, uh, where, 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 where he was on six, seven, and eight, right? And in verse, let me see what that six, eleven. Yeah, that's how we derived it. That particular way, Mark. Part of it. It's just mostly because the angel came down. So that's September eleventh. And then we could see that 611 can represent September 11th and November 9th in a mirror. Right, right. Right. It can be 911 and it can be 116. Right. Well, That's if you the use different mirror, mirrors, the, the different okay. mirrors and the locations of it. Yeah. So if you use a mirror, yeah. So if you use a mirror and you put it above, you would get 911. That's right. right. Okay. And then, so, yeah. I'm just so, trying to get this stuff straight in my mind, bro. And, and 9 11, very helpful. A 9 11 can be 11 9. Right. So that actually is actually a. I noticed it before, but I didn't really notice it. Notice it, notice it until I just read it again. Okay. Um, so, so the question here that we're now dealing with is this arrival of the third angel. Are we correct in just saying the third angel, the arrival of the third angel is Judges 7, you know, without a specific verse? Um, because in understanding this line, one of the things we, we haven't really addressed is what the period of darkness is here. Now, even if we go to this line above, um, even this line of Gideon, what is the period of darkness here? Because remember, we're coming to November 9th, 2019. We have a period of darkness. And we have a... You know, a message arrived, which is November 9th, 2019. And, and what is that message? Well, we know it has to relate to um, the dates that are on that line later, right? So it relates in some way to those dates. But we haven't really defined here what the period of darkness is. Right? We had in, in this one, Deborah and Barak, this had to do with time in our message, right? Right. But it also had to do with the time in our message in regard to Parminder's understanding of time. So this period of darkness is, you know, dealing with, uh, with Parminder, particularly, you know, his time setting. So September 23rd, 2017 is going to be in response to that. But now we have a period of dark, and, and, and that's why we end up 
with these way marks that we do, because this is going to be about the time message of November 9th. But now when we get to November 9th, and, and when we did this too, remember we said that this arrival of the third message had to do with the 273, right? Yes. It had to do with what was presented then. So in this line of Gideon, on November 9th, we have... We know that July 18th coming. We already have this structure by November 9th, 2019. But the message that has arrived here actually has to do with the message to the Levites. Because that message does arrive on November 9th. Now, Jeff, on that date, what was he presenting? What was his message? Anybody remember? Was that when Jeff said that all 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 of the predictions that Tess had said were going to fail? Was it on that well, date? Well, no, he said that previous. So he had been teaching that for a while. Um, so uh, let me see if I can, I'm trying to find it here. That wasn't a close of probation statement, was it? No, that was March 27th, 2019. That was the shut door uh, presentation prior to the camp meeting. So, I'm trying to remember myself what it was. So this is going to be way back there. It didn't have nothing to do with July 18, did it? No. Um, So it was so November. So there it is. So he's going to talk about this disappointment. So he is talking about the disappointment of of. Uh, of November 9th itself. And, and I'm trying to figure this out here. Yeah, so he's going back to the rebellion that happened. And he's going to deal with August 29th, 2019. He's going to deal with December 25th date, uh, Sunday. He's going to deal with Charlemagne and Clovis. He has 496 for Clovis being baptized on December 25th. So remember, Charlemagne was crowned as emperor on December 25th, 800, right? Is that correct? That's when Charlemagne was crowned? Yes. Okay, so, so he's going to deal with that December 25th. He also has 1717 in there. And he has the 81, and I'm not sure. Uh, 1717 was uh, the year that the Pope, Pius VI, and he was born on December 25th. Okay. And then what about uh, 274 AD? So he has the word sun there. Okay. So, yeah. So that's in the... Uh, the 
Um, there's a temple set up, the sun worship, uh, the unconquerable sun. Okay. There's a lot. There's a lot of name for it. So Invictus, I think it is something like that. Yeah. So um, so that solar solo solus Invictus. Yeah. So that's by or the, the Emperor Aurelian. So he sets that out in December twenty fifth, two seventy four. Okay. Yeah, so all these December 25ths, and we know the 496 one now is 508 instead of 496. And then what he's going to do is he's going to address also the 29th of August, 1799. So that's when uh, Pope Pius VI dies while in exile. Um, and it's going to be 220 years to the baptism of, or not to the baptism, uh, to the, uh, well, I guess why he has baptism there, I guess, has something to do with Parminder's movement, but um, that's going to be the, um, you and Odilio and John Mark being brought before that tribunal. Um, so this August 29th date becomes important. There was something else that he did. Um, so he's addressing the Sunday law. So I guess the best thing that we could say about what Jeff is presenting is he's presenting 321 as, as marking the midnight cry, Panium, July 18th, 2020. And, and then he has 538 as the Sunday law. So he's, he's going to the Sunday law in March 7th, 321. And he's marking that with Paneum and July 18. So if we're going to sort of simplify this, um, he's going to deal with this November 9th, um, the 777 days. Okay. So if we're going to then try to look at 9-11. So at 9-11, what is Jeff addressing? He's addressing the entire 777 structure. Okay, but he, he's addressing the end of it and the middle, July 18, right? So he's going to be stressing, we have November 9th, we have this 777 structure. It's about the Sunday law that's coming, right? So remember, we don't say that the Sunday law is going to come on December 25th, 2021. That's not the argument. We're just saying that this line represents the Sunday law. December 25th represents the Sunday law. And that the Sunday law has to come after that. It can't come before, right? Now, in the first angel's message, all three messages are contained, right? So he's giving this first angel's message as, you know, basically fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come which is the Sunday law, the close of probation. So, so Jeff understands that this, this November 9th date that Parminder and Tess picked, they picked the wrong attributes for this date. But now Jeff is going to say that this is going to be, you know, this attack on Nashville, right? And that this is going to be a date connected with the Sunday law in some way. But we also have another message, and that's the 273. So the 273 is going to be addressing March 27th, right? Yes. Now, okay. Now, now, March 27th is going to come into this line. So what we have here is we have basically our 777 line is the line of Gideon. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward here. But what we never really had before from was these, these other dates in between. We did have the March 27th date, and we have to decide where that goes in this line. Um, so, so what dates are being marked here is this formalization of this July 18 message and this empowerment of this July 18th message.
And when we look at June 27th, we know that it's a symbolic um, um, empowerment in the sense that nothing happens there, but we find out about this date and it helps us understand where we are in the lines. And we have this symbolic 21 days of fasting, this three whole weeks leading us to July 18th. And July 18th, what happens on July 18th that is significant as the arrival of the second angel's message? Okay, well, Lorenz says division, but, but this is an arrival of a message. So we do have a disappointment, which causes division, right? So the Millerite history, that's April 19th. But, you know, we had also marked July 18th as October 22nd, 1844. We had actually marked it as the disappointment in the fall of 1844, not the disappointment in the spring. But in some ways, July 18th represents the disappointment in the spring. It also represents Samuel Snow's letters, and it also represents the disappointment in the fall, depending which line you're looking at. Right? Because it's different way marks on different lines. But here in this line, if it's the arrival of the second angel's message, it's the disappointment in the spring, right? So, so if it's if it's the spring disappointment, um, we have an arrival of a message that happens here, but it's not perceived because in Millerite history, when they have the disappointment in the spring, do they have a message already prepared, talking about the fall, Samuel Snow? He's already prepared that message. And it, it's just the movement has to wait till the disappointment until they can receive that message because they're focused upon the spring. Now, in, in dealing with that part of it, we know that I present on July 18th, well, technically July 17th, but the evening beginning July 18th from a biblical perspective, I'm presenting the 777 structure from that connects with the Mayan date and also has September 23rd in it, and it goes right back. Really, the whole line goes back uh, to my birth. It's all connected there. It goes all the way back to the start of the mind calendar, I guess, too. But we show that there is these disappointments that occur, and um, that is, they're failed time predictions. And so, even though I'd been studying this and I knew about this way back in April of 2020, that we were on a line of failed predictions, I, I present that on the 17th, so just that evening. And, and I present it again on the 19th. So on the 19th, I'm going to present the same message that I presented on the 17th. And I believe that we have an answer to what July 18th is about, that we can't predict events. And of course, we're gonna still continue studying this, but it's a line of failed predictions. So what does that mean for this movement? So that's the message that comes here. Now, we have a formalization of a message and an empowerment of a message that comes in connection with this message of July 18th. So what would those dates be? Well, in order to know what those dates are, we would need to look at Judges chapter 8, or Judges chapter 7, I should say, right? That is, the line that we have here of Judges chapter 7 
is addressing those events after July 18th. And we could also maybe even say Judges chapter 8. Maybe, maybe we could take something from each of these lines. Because Judges chapter 7 doesn't have very much between July 18th and December 25th. But Judges 8 does. And the dates that I would see here um, as the formalization and the empowerment of the message. What do we have Judges 8 verse 1? December 6, 2020. Why is Judges 8 verse 1? December 26, 2020. So if we go to Judges 8, and the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou calledest us not when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide him sharply. So this message of July 18, maybe, you know, what we could say with, um, uh, you know, Iran puts, you know, 920 is more the symbol of the division. Um, but we can see this division that that's coming in this movement. So the men of Ephraim, they, they keep coming into play in these stories. And it, it's progressive, isn't it? Apparently. Okay, so so when does Ephraim first come in in the book of Judges? What's what's where's Ephraim involved in that story? So when we go to Judges, we have uh, the first time that they're dealt with is in, um, well, I mean, we're going to skip when, when they're dealing with it here, um, is Judges 3.27. It came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mount of, mountain of Ephraim, and the children of Israel went down with him from the mount, and he before him. And he dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim, right? So we're going to have this. So what is Ephraim representing? Ain't Ephraim one mentioned but with the sticks, the two sticks. Right. So the joining of the two sticks. Sticks. So Ephraim is Joseph, of course, and you have um, uh, Ephraim and Judah, right? So they're the, the two sticks. They're separated uh, in the story of Joseph, and and they're they're also symbolized in the book of e e uh, Ezekiel as being. Ephraim is be northern Israel and Judah, of course, being southern Israel. But we know we have Ephraim here is is in some ways some aspect of this movement or of God's people. But they're progressively going to be worse, right? In the story of Gideon, Gideon's going to appease them. And then when we get later into the story of, um, of uh, that's, what's the guy's name? Jephthah. Yeah, Jephthah. That's where it's going to be. In the story of Jephthah, it's going to be all out, all, out, all out war, right? So, so what is happening? What is Ephraim representing? Because they're first with the movement, but eventually they're fighting against the movement completely.
So what's happening in the movement that's being represented here in the story of Gideon? Now we have December 6, 2020 for Judges 8, verse 1. What, what happens in the context of this line with December 6, 2020? It was another instance of the 20th day of the ninth month in a declaration. Right. So it's the 20th day of the ninth month. So it's connected to this third angel arriving. Okay. So, so we know that the movement Ephraim in this context is, is upset because it wasn't called, but was it called? Yeah, yes, it was called. Yeah. Yeah. And and connected with July 18th and July 19th in the messages that were being given regarding July 18th, that it's on a line of failed predictions. And what July 18th meant, they indeed were called, but why were they unhappy? Why was Bronwyn and Larry Hine and Larry Lesher and 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 Gee and all those people, why were they so upset with July 18th and the messages that had been being taught about July 18th after July 18th? Tom said. Okay, well, that's not really why. I mean, that's an excuse. Um, they, were view they were viewing that we were holding on to time setting and that time setting should never have been part of what we were doing. They were unwilling to study further to see what was to be determined as the Millerites had done regarding October 22nd, 1844. Right. So they were unwilling to do what God had counseled us to do, which was to study together. Right. And and, you know, to examine the foundation, the reasons why we were in this situation. They weren't willing to look at things. And, and it was because they, they were disappointed and uh, their pride was hurt, right? You know, they had, had stood up saying that July 18th is going to be this event, believing that they would be vindicated. And in the end, they're not. And so they weren't happy about that. And... And, and I became the easy target of that. But they were not listening to what I was saying at all. Because I've always been opposed to time setting. But you were, it, you, you were not just the easy target. <laughs> I wasn't? No. Well, I'm the guy who came up with July 18. So maybe I'm not the easy target. I'm the at least the, the tar target. Well, you because were the primary target, and everybody else that got involved with that was the secondary targets. Yeah, but but I, I say I'm an easy target in the sense that you know I'm not I'm not a popular personality. I mean, I'm I don't have those those skills to be really really likable by people who you know have a certain other types of personalities. So I can't be, be all things tall men, and my stuff is rather complicated and. There's lots of other things, you know, just in my life that people could look at and and try to to distort. But but the reality is, they they just didn't want to examine the truth, and I'm the guy who's examining the truth because that's what I do, right? I'm examining every detail, and they don't want to do that. The thing, the thing that we're going also going to have to pay attention to. God has gifted you with a forehead of flint. In this situation, the, the Bronwyns, the Larry Hines, the Guy McConnells, 
they wanted this to be a message, a more popular message. Mm -hmm. Because they felt that if it was popular, there would be more people that would join in. Mm -hmm. Now, I respect Larry Hine, but he's one that more chooses to follow what those that he sees as a leader is telling him. Now, yeah, and I understand that. I mean, I understand, you know, why people do that and that and that can be sometimes a type of humility. I mean, it can be that a person it doesn't have a confidence in themselves and they look to others for that confidence. But no. that can be a dangerous thing. We need to look to Christ. There there's other reasons with Larry. Yeah, I know. But to talk about other people and know all those reasons, I'm just talking in a general sense. Right. Right. So, so there's, you know, so in a general sense, you know, we can look at human nature and we can see why people would be hurt and, and, and why their feelings are the way they are. I mean, you, you put a lot of things behind this message, you put your reputation on the line, so to speak, and the things that you're saying don't happen and uh, the people around you aren't happy with you and, and it, there's a lot of negative consequences as a result, and, and you want to look for a scapegoat. It's perfectly understandable, right? There's, it's not like you have to be pretty evil to, to feel that way. The problem is that we have to know what is true based upon God's word, not upon how we feel or how other people perceive things. And and so we stand for the truth in as much a Christ-like manner as we can. You know, we're not standing for the truth in some sort of self-righteous, arrogant manner. Um, you know, try to be as tasteful as possible, because that's what some people do. They, they get on their little soapbox and they become really annoying. So, you know, so we have tried to to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves in presenting this message to this movement. But what happened with December 6th was completely unreasonable. It was not the thing to do. Um, to set up a committee that was already fixed to decide, you know, with already a conclusion and to basically bully their way um, in with this declaration uh, was totally uncalled for. You know, because the people involved, people like me, I'm pretty amiable. I'm going to cooperate with you. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to be uh, conciliatory, right? I'm not, I'm not somebody who's out there to, you know, push my agenda. I want to work with the group. Right. But the group was not willing to look at anything. And I didn't take any really harsh stands or anything. My, my positions were very conciliatory. If you look at, you know, what was happening there, saying, OK, I understand how you feel. I can attest to that. Yeah. But we need to look at these things and and they just shut it all down. So that's now to say that that's the formalization of a message. Um. Why would this be the formalization? Because it's not so much their actions that are formalizing this message, though it does lead to it. Because what happens really on December 6, 2020, that would be the formalization of this message? Um, the actual declaration? No, the declaration isn't. Because that, that's their message against this message. So that's not going to be the formalization of the message enlighten us well think about um what ha what followed uh, people were removed okay so people are going to be removed and and we're going to have a um well i'm going to write a paper right away <laughs> right 
Yeah, so, I remember reading it. So what happened is it's our response to what happens that is the formalization of the message. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Because we, we end up formalizing that message in response to this declaration. So the declaration happens, but now we we are separate now from FFA. We're, we're shut out of this institution that had been carrying this message. We're no longer a part of FFA. Now, you know, maybe we can say that, because um, um, I do have a Facebook page, uh, the FFA study group. Um, but I think I originally entitled it uh, the outcasts of FFA or something like that. I re I changed the name later on. <laughs> um, so, um, but, but we did end up creating this uh, FFA study group, which was FFA outcasts or something. I can't remember the exact title. Um, we now had this formalization of a message because we had gone through this whole period of study and we now had what our message was because they, in a sense, they helped us define it. Our message was that we can't set dates, that we can't know uh, what events are going to happen. Now, part of that happens uh, also results from what happened on the 4th and the 5th. So what happened on December 4th? Because I, I write a paper called Three Days. So um, that's that's my response to this whole situation. So what happens on December 4th? Does anybody know? Is that when Daniel on the horse presented? No, it's it's going to be Daniel Vanderhorst is going to present on December fifth. So that's going to be that's going to be part of this whole thing. Um, but we're going to have Dan. Um, we're going to have um, what's the guy's name? Uh, Derek. Um, just can't think of his last name. Um, is it uh, Derek McWilliams or Williams? Yeah, Derek Williams. That's right. So if we go all the way back to that long ago time, um, yeah. So there's going to be a a publication of his. So we're going to have a Derek Williams has a letter. I'm going to uh, read his letter in a study on December fourth um uh, go over his letter and and then daniel vanderhorst on the fifth is going to present his study that gets stopped that gets shut down which which i then um i download uh, right away as soon as it's over because i know that they're not gonna put it up they're gonna delete it and so then i upload it Kelly shares it on WhatsApp and they believe that he's the one that shared it. So they block him. Um, <laughs> he's the one that uploaded it. Right. So, so there's all this crazy stuff happening, but it happens in this, this period of time, uh, this three days. And this three days is a call to Jerusalem to repent of our marriage to our strange wives in this line, right? Because it's going to be the 20th day of the ninth month on the biblical calendar that they published this, this paper, right? And it also has symbols of the 2520 and, and other things as well. So all of these things happen. Uh, um, yeah. uh, is that when he was talking about the, um, the, um, it was, Daniel was talking about the, um, these um, numbers having it, something to do with prophecy and stuff. Yeah. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that, now yeah. I know what what you're talking yeah. about. So this is this is all going to happen there, um, and then um, so the Derek Williams letter is part of this. Yes. Yeah, so October thirteenth, the eighteenth, eight thirteenth date was leading up to this. So there was all of these things that were happening in this movement, 
that really um, starts to develop the, uh, um, the formalization of this message. So I, I end up writing a paper called Three Days in Ezra and Nehemiah, their relation to events from December 4th to 6th, 2020. Um, and so there I'm going to address that just sort of immediately after, after those events. Um, let's see here. So. Yeah, because that because that was when he was. That's when they was telling everybody that we shouldn't be that night. That on um, July eighteenth was no longer <clears throat> no longer um. Valid because because we needed to start apologizing to people because we set the dates and stuff. If I, yeah. remember, if, I, if I remember correctly, yeah. And there's no way that we could set dates uh, or don't set dates to apologize for setting dates for warning people about what could possibly happen. Yeah, there was no way possible we were going so to. Well, that, most some of us. Yeah, that was definitely in God's leading in doing that and giving that warning. Which is partly Absolutely. why I believe my warnings about the failed prediction were went unheeded. I believe that was God's in God's providence. So, um, so you know, we had um, my presentation um, of the letter. Um, I'm just trying to I'm trying to remember all, all the details of it. I might be getting some of the details wrong of, of what happened there, but I'm pretty sure. Derek Williams' letter was the Friday, the 4th. And I'm just looking over my paper where it talks about this. So, um, yeah. So, December. I'm trying to remember some of it. So, here's what I wrote about Friday, December 4th. The weekend began with the examination of Derek M. Williams' letter that was posted on WhatsApp. Uh, this post was made into a PDF and became the topic of study for our regular. Friday night Zoom. At this time, there was a call by many to see the things we have in common and to utilize these as a basis for study. Derek was one of those voices. He chose to remind us of the common ground of 9-11 and how all of our present understanding was inextricably connected to this event. The leadership in the movement were critical of this position. They had already made their decision. It had been pointed out that this decision was made known on November 22, 2020, which was November 9th, Julian. And on November 28th, Elder Toby Imler gave a pointed message that called both parties to repent and look at the foundation of our message that we held in common. This sermon was taken seriously by some. The, pre pre the precious council uh, was rejected by the FFA leadership. It bore fruit with many on the side of July 18. It seems that Derek M. Williams' letter was the result of following this council. The Lord was placing every opportunity before all of us to recognize his leading. That these opportunities were squandered was seen in the events that followed, and that would be the Sabbath, December 5th, Daniel Vanderhorst's um, sermon, and then, of course, uh, December 6th, you're going to have the declaration, right? So, and then I deal with what happens immediately after December 6th. And, and one of the things that happens, of course, is what I would call the empowerment of that message. Now, I put it as December 25th, 2020. So the bombing of Nashville, to me, is the empowerment of this message, so we have an event that occurs um, after July 18. And, and why is December 25th? What, what's the connection here between December 25th and these other dates? 
So from 622, it's going to be 187 days, right? I know we're going a little bit over time here. but So if we take this, and we, we just, or this, right? So we'll come back to this tomorrow. But you can see why we need How this how this fits in. So that's going to be the empowerment to that message. So when we look at our line, we can now fit in these two dates and this date. But but I don't have the March twenty seventh date in this line. The March twenty seventh, twenty twenty one. Okay, so so we have the these dates, but these dates are all going to be zoomed into by the three chapters in Gideon six, seven, and eight. So, but this is this is the whole line of Gideon, and then and then we have to look at exactly what events in the story of Gideon are going to be marked here by these these dates. So, so we still have a work to do on this line, even though we put dates on our line, we can see in the story of Gideon where they apply. Okay, so um, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and uh, for the discussion and um, for the way that you have been leading us, this movement. We pray for the movement presently and even for those in the past who may have been associated with this movement um, whose hearts may still be uh, being spoken to by your spirit. We ask, Lord, that um, events and circumstances in their lives can lead them to examine again a light that they may have rejected um, without a full knowledge and that they can come back to you. We pray for each person um, who is struggling. Thank you, Lord, uh, for the time this morning. We pray that you can bring us together again tomorrow morning and also this afternoon as we look at a simplification of the lines. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.